I'm in 2 Kings 19, looking at King Hezekiah. And in this chapter, King Hezekiah is renting his clothes and covering himself in sackcloth, and he's in great mourning and, and sorrow because of the words of Rabshakeh. This guy named Rabshakeh, one of the king of Assyria's henchmen, he's came with this horrible message. Back there in 2 Kings uh, 18 verse 28 it says Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews language and spake saying hear the word of the great king the king of Assyria and he's just trying to get him to doubt God trying to get him to doubt Hezekiah trying to get, put him in fear you know Rabshakeh and the king of Assyria they're like the what we would see as the modern day news media and social media and TikTok and all that stuff that's always trying to scare you and put this stuff in your head to make you doubt God and question the Bible and question your pastor and everything else. That's what Rabshakeh and the king of Assyria is like. Rabshakeh is just a messenger of Satan. You know, Paul talks about how uh, he had a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he should be exalted above measure, something that's that pretty much kept him close to God. God will allow a messenger of Satan to keep you close to him and hezekiah this messenger of satan rabshakeh has got hezekiah coming to the lord getting close to god you see god will use your enemies to keep you close to him so it says in second kings 19 verse 1 and it came to pass when king hezekiah heard it when he heard these Horrible words of Rapshaka. He heard the message. He rents his clothes. That he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth. And went into the house of the Lord. So, uh, the renting of your clothes and covering yourself in sackcloth was a sign that you're in mourning. And he just goes straight to God. He goes straight into the house of the Lord. And like I said, trouble will lead you to God. The best thing to do is, maybe things are going good in your life right now, go ahead and get close to God right now while things are going good, then when things are going bad, you'll already be close to God. So he just goes instant in prayer. You know, Paul says in Romans 12, 12, talks about being instant in prayer. And, you know, a lot of this is a picture of what's going to take place in the tribulation, and the king of Assyria is a picture of the Antichrist, and you could say King Hezekiah is a picture of Israel. And in the tribulation, Israel is going to turn to God when they f find out that the Antichrist is not who he says he was, not who he says he is. So he's turning to God here. And it says in verse 2, And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. So he gets them to start mourning as well. And there is a, like it says in Ecclesiastes 3, 4, there's a time to, time to mourn and there's a time to weep. You know, a lot of preachers might get you thinking that you're to always be just on this mountaintop, never sad, but there's a time to mourn, there's a time to weep. You know, in Romans 12 15 I believe yeah Romans 12 15 let me look make sure I'm giving you the right reference Romans 12 and verse 15 yeah it says rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep there's a time to mourn there's a time to weep and Isaiah 53 3 talking about a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ it says a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief that's the Christian life. A lot of times, you're going to be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, if you're following the Lord's pattern. Then Ecclesiastes 7.3, another great verse in regards to this, it says, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. Yeah, Hezekiah went through this scare from King Assyria, but I guarantee you his heart was much better afterwards than it was before.
So he gets his boys here. They get covered in sack sackcloth. And they go to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And I'm pretty sure that this is the first time that you see Isaiah's name in the Bible. Yeah, as far as I can tell, the first time you see Isaiah's name in the Bible. So they know the real prophet to go to. Isaiah the prophet. And they know the real prophet from the false prophet. And that makes a lot of sense. Go to your pastor. Go to your go to the word of God itself to get some help. That's the first thing they did was went to the prophet, went to the word of God to get some help. So Hezekiah, he's really doing the right thing in this chapter. He's a good king. And verse 3 says, And they said unto him, said unto Isaiah, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble. Now look at some of these key words, a day of trouble. What's that remind you of? Obviously the time of Jacob's trouble, which what most people call the tribulation. This day is a day of trouble and of rebu rebuke. I have such a hard time saying that word, rebuke. A, a day of trouble and of rebuke. And blasphemy for the children are come to the birth and there is not strength to bring forth once again look at the key words of blasphemy what's going to go on in the tribulation in the time of Jacob's trouble blasphemy the Antichrist Romans or Revelation 13 6 he's going to open his mouth in blasphemy against God just like the king of Assyria just like Rabshakeh you know, king of Assyria and Rabshakeh, that's kind of reminding me of the Antichrist and the false prophet. And then you've got the spirit behind them, the red dragon. So it's a day of trouble. you got a guy opening his mouth in blasphemy. And then look what it says, for the children are come to the birth. That's going to remind you of Israel in the tribulation. They give birth to a man-child in a time of trouble. And also, any time that the Lord is describing just a horrible time or a time of great pain like the tribulation, he describes it as travail upon a woman with child. So it says, For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. So Israel, uh, Judah in this situation, King Hezekiah and Judah in this situation, he's king of Judah, they're like a travailing woman, with no strength left to bring forth the child. He's pretty much coming to God saying, I don't have the strength. We don't have the strength to take on king of Assyria. You come to God like that, you're going to get somewhere. You come to God with your problems saying you don't have enough strength without him to make it, you're going to start getting somewhere. Come to God and really believe that, that you don't have the strength because you really don't to make it without him. It says in verse 4, it may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So, he says, he wants them, he's got them telling Isaiah, he wants the Lord to hear the words of Rabshakeh. And now obviously he knows the Lord hears all. He knows the Lord hears every word that's spoken. And you know, Matthew twelve thirty six, you know, says every idle word that men shall speak, they're going to give account thereof in the day of judgment. He knows the Lord hears all. But he's he's pleading with he's wanting Isaiah to plead with God to do something about what he is hearing. He wants God to do something about what he does here. You see, if God took vengeance on every word, you know, right now, like if God just decided right now he's going to take vengeance on every word spoken against God, there'd just be dead people laying all over the street. You know, obviously God hears everything, but he doesn't do something about every bad thing yet. So I, uh, Hezekiah is wanting the Lord to go ahead and take action against the reproach that's going on. It says, Whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God. He's speaking these blasphemous things, and Hezekiah is wanting something done about it. 
He's wanting uh, the Lord to repro reprove the words which the Lord has heard. And lift up, he wants Isaiah to lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. Once again, another word to watch, remnant. Just like in the tribulation, there's going to be a faithful remnant of Jews. In this case, this faithful remnant of Israel is Judah. And so he says, For Isaiah to lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. Now, that reminds me of 1 Timothy 2.8. Where Paul says, I would therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, without wrath and doubting. That lifting up holy hands, talking about lifting up in prayer. That's the context of 1 Timothy 2. He's wanting Isaiah to lift up his hands in prayer for the remnant that's left. And it says in verse 5, So the servants... Well, first, let's think about that living God where it says that living God that just jumps off the page at me. Because that's a key to this chapter. The God of King Hezekiah and Judah is a living God. The rest of the gods talked about in this chapter are dead gods. The other gods are dead gods. But Jesus Christ said in Revelation 118, I am he that liveth and was dead. The fact that he rose from the dead proved that he was God. And he, when he did die, he did it voluntarily for us. Now verse 5, 2 Kings 19, 5. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. So here come the servants of Isaiah. They come, or the servants of Hezekiah, they go to Isaiah just like he asked them to. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Here's what Isaiah tells him to say back to Hezekiah. He says, tell him this. He says, thus saith the Lord. Now you're dealing with the word of God here. Thus saith the Lord. He says, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard. That's a key phrase, be not afraid. See, that's what everybody wants you to do today is be very afraid. That's all you got going on is fear mongering around everywhere you turn. And it seems like every time I open the Bible, it's telling me not to be afraid. Yet all these other people want me to be afraid. The news, anything you see, anywhere, trying to get you to be afraid of something, trying to get you to doubt God. And that's what Rabshakeh and the king of Assyria want, and the devil wants, is for you to doubt God. And Isaiah says, be not afraid. You know, the Bible's over and over. You know, don't be afraid of a people more than thou. Look at let's look at some verses to go along with it. In Deuteronomy twenty and verse one, it says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. He said, Be not of afraid uh of a people more than thou. Don't be afraid of their horses. Don't be afraid of their chariots. You know, it's the same thing to Hezekiah here. You know, king of Assyria and his army, that's a pretty intimidating bunch of guys. But don't be afraid of a people more than thou. Look at Second Chronicles 32 and verse 7. He says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria. Not for all the multitude that is with him, for there be for there be more with us than with them. You know, it's just like when Elijah showed his servant, he said, They that be with us are more than they would than that be with them. And then he opened his eyes and he saw chariots and horses round about. And in Second Chronicles thirty two eight it says, With him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. You see, when a man starts speaking like that and speaks the truth of the Bible, you can rest on his words because that's the Lord's words. You can find rest and comfort in it. So there's more with us than with the enemy. 
In Jeremiah 1, 8, it says, Be not afraid of their faces. In 1 Peter 3, 14, it says, Be not afraid of their terror. What do they want you to do today? Be afraid of terrorists and all these evil people. But these are just men. You got the God of heaven. So, Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard. Just don't even think about it. Just keep going, doing what you know to be right, and God will take care of the rest. With which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. So you see, God knows. God heard the blasphemy that was spoken. And he says in verse 7, Behold, I will send a blast upon him. He's blaspheming me. I'm going to send a blast upon him. And he shall hear a rumor and return and shall return to his own land. So you see, he's just going to hear a rumor and run off. And it says, And I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. And that does come to pass. You'll see it in verse 37. And just like the Antichrist, he's going to fall by a sword. The Lord's coming down with a sharp two-edged sword in Revelation 19. He's going to smite the nations with it. And it says, They're slain by him that sat on the horse. So he says in verse 8, So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish, and when he heard say of Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, Behold, he has come out to fight against thee. He sent messengers again unto Hezekiah, saying, Look at how much, um, in verse 8 and 9 here, the king of Assyria, look how much work he's doing. See, the devil likes workers, and no doubt king, the king of Assyria is an evil worker. He is busy for the devil. Moving from here and there, just causing trouble everywhere he goes, picking fights everywhere he goes. You know, the devil, he's a worker. He's going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down in it. The Antichrist, he's going to be an evil worker, causing trouble all over the globe. So he sends messengers to Hezekiah again. See, got these people sending these letters, sending these, writing these articles, writing these comments, making these videos to scare people. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Look at this. Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Syria. Look at that. Look at the just blatant, just against the word of God. Anytime someone is casting doubt on the word of God, think of Genesis chapter 3. The first time the devil shows up, he says, Yea, hath God said. The first thing that comes out of his mouth to a person is getting them to question the word of God. Just like the king of Assyria, the first thing out of his mouth is getting somebody to question the word of God. He said, Don't trust in this God of yours. He's just trying to deceive you. He said, He can't keep you from being delivered into my hand. Look at how cocky and full of yourself you got to be to make such a comment. I would be afraid of being struck dead to make such a comment. And then it says, he says in verse 11, he says in verse 11, Behold, Thou hast heard what the kings of, As of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? Well, I mean, the devil, he's, he's knocked out so many people. He's going to come and say to you, you know, I've knocked out Moses, I've knocked out David, I've knocked out Abraham, I've knocked out everybody. But there's one person you haven't knocked out, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. When you came to him in Matthew chapter 4, he knocked you out. When you tried to battle him when he was on the cross, he knocked you out. Uh, in Revelation 19 and 20, he knocked you out some more times. 
So, and that's the God I'm serving. So, obviously, I can't take down the devil. I can't take down any of his henchmen. But I have a God that can take down him and his henchmen. So, I'm trusting in God to deliver me. And in verse 11, he says, Behold, thou hast heard when the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? You think about it. The king of Assyria is saying this, bragging about how he took down all these other kings, but this was simply ants beating another group of ants and another group of ants. It was only by the allowance of God that he let the king of Assyria beat the other ants. It was only by God allowing that to happen. And so it proves nothing. It's uh, worm food beating up a bunch of other worm food. Because that's all the king of Assyria is, is worm food. He's going back to the dust. He's going to be eaten of worms. It says, Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed? As Gozan and Haran and Rispah and the children of Eden, which were in Tel Telahaser. He says, Have the gods of the nations delivered them? Well, no, because... Notice, little g gods, those gods are fake, they're false, they're phonies. They can't see, hear, or walk, according to Revelation 9.20. Let's look at some more verses about these fake gods. Psalm 115, Psalm 115, verse 7. It says, They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. See, they're fake. And then it says, They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. That's some pretty strong words for those false gods. And then you think about Dagon over there in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face. He fell flat on his face to the ground, you see before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. You see, their God fell flat on his face. The Lord did that to their God and they had to pick their God up. Imagine if your God is so weak that you had to pick him up. So that's the gods that the king of Assyria has defeated. He hasn't defeated the God of heaven. So he's bragging about stupid stuff. Yeah, you beat all these gods. You beat all these mortal men up. But you can't do that to the God of heaven. And then in Judges 10, 13 through 14, Judges 10, 13 and 14, it says, yeah, uh, The Lord says to Israel, Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Well, they can't deliver anybody. And that's the gods that the king of Assyria has defeated. He's not beat the real God. Now verse 13, it says, Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sepharvaim, of Hena and Iva? Well, obviously they're all dead. You know why? Because those kings are men. They're mortals. But now the king of Assyria is messing with the king of kings. 1 Timothy 6.15 Look, look what it says about him in 1 Timothy 6.15. It says, I think I gave you the wrong verse.
Yeah, First Timothy 6.15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. That's the king he's about to mess with now. And this ain't just a regular king, like the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad and the king of the city of Sephorvam, of Hena and of Iba. Yeah, all them are dead. So what? So what? All of them are dead. All the kings he's went against are dead or he's took them for a prisoner or whatever he's done with them. None of that matters because those are mortal men. And then you got verse 14. And King and Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers. Somebody's always sending a letter. Like Jezebel sending something to Elijah. In 2 Thessalonians, the troublemakers sending messages, sending letters and freaking out the Thessalonians. Somebody's always trying to send something. So they send a hand of the uh, sent a letter by the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. That's the thing you do. Take your problems to God, spread all your problems out before him, and let him take care of the problems. If he chooses to, then great. If he chooses not to take care of the problem, then that's the best thing for you, and it's just going to make you stronger in the end. Because you're made, your strength's made perfect in weakness, remember? Take your problems to God and spread out your problems all over the table in front of him and let him take care of it. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, now he's getting down to business, O Lord God of Israel. See, he called him the living God back there in verse 4. Now he's calling him the God of Israel. It says, which dwellest between the cherubims. He says, thou art the God so he said, he called him the living God, he called him the God of Israel, and he called him the God. He is the God, he's the only God. Isaiah 44, 8, the Lord himself said, you know, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, there's one God and one meteor between God and me and the man Christ Jesus. In John 1, 1 through 5, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was light, and this light was a light of men. That lieth every man that cometh into the world. The Word was made flesh, and what among us? So there's one God, and there's no God beside Him. He says, Lord, bow down thine ear, and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. So he's saying, Lord, do something about it. He knows he the Lord hears it because he hears everything, but he's wanting him to do something about what he's hearing. It reminds me of the common saying, are you just going to let him talk to you like that? You know, he doesn't want the Lord to... Let him just reproach him like that and reproach his people without doing something about it. It says, Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations in their lands. It is true. He didn't lie about that. He's, he's just taken out everybody. And it says in verse 18, And have cast their gods into the fire. That's true. But look what he says. The key word, as I've been telling you, you here, For they were no gods. But the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. That's why they were destroyed, because they were just the work of men's hands. So he says in verse 19, Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. You see, give God a good reason to answer the prayer. Make the motive behind your prayer be for him to get glory and for his plan to be fulfilled. Don't make it about you. Make it about him. And make that be why you're asking the prayer anyway. He says, Save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. You see, if, if the king of Assyria has knocked out all these kings and false gods, 
but then he goes up against Judah and can't take out the a feeble king and a feeble people, then that shows that they got the right God. And the world will see it and fear the Lord God. But I'll go ahead and stop there at the paragraph mark.